Hello good people of the internet, my name is Andy, you're watching Geek Curio. Hello and welcome back. Now earlier this week I had the opportunity to speak to James who runs Stormfang which is producing RPG supplements on Drive-Thru RPG. Now as you may remember if you've watched some of our previous videos I have actually done a review on one of his previous supplements how deconstructing D&D 5th edition races and you can find the link for that up here. But for now let's go to the interview and see how James is getting on. Hello James and welcome to Geek Curio. Thank you very much for joining me. How are you today? I am alive. And given I live in Scotland and it's about 22 degrees outside, that is about as optimistic as you can really say. <laughs> it's very hot, um, but we're doing okay. Are you going to be enjoying the, the weather later? Um, if you mean run and hide in a fridge, yes. Um, <laughs> no, sadly I will be forced outside in shorts to walk the dog. But yeah, I'll be outside somewhere. Excellent, excellent. Well, like I say, thank you very much for joining me. And um, the wonderful thing about you being on the show today is we get to talk not just about miniature painting but we're also going to be talking a little bit about role playing and a supplement that you are you currently have in the works and I think you're going to be doing a full campaign behind it as well is that right yep. yeah yeah excellent quite a big chunk of stuff yes so I'm really looking forward to hearing much more about that like I say we get to talk quite a bit on our Goblin the Mor <laughs> Goblins of Mordor discord channel and I've seen that you've been painting your Marvel. It's something protocol, isn't it? Oh God, I've crisis, crisis protocol. protocol. I knew it said action protocol then. And I think I think the work there that you've been doing is absolutely fantastic. I've really loved that. How did you first get into miniature painting originally? So it's a long, 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 long time ago. Um, I was maybe about twelve or so. Um, and my family and me, we just moved back from Hong Kong because mm -hmm. um, my dad was in there. And we were going through a high street in, I think it was Glasgow, um, around the corner from the big central station that's there. Mm -hmm. And we walked past Games Workshop. And in the window was this big box labelled Necromunda. And I was like, ooh. <laughs> um, that looks cool. And there was painted miniatures in there and some cardboard scenery on plastic um, click together. Um, vertical walls and everything else and I thought that looks really cool um, so we went in had a look at everything we bought that box and really it kind of rolled on from there so ever since we came back to Scotland um, and ha were able to have things because obviously when you're trying to move countries a lot taking mm -hmm. lots of stuff with you is a bad plan no. um, so now that we had the opportunity to sort of amass collections of random stuff as children are want to do mm -hmm. um, I started miniature painting along with a load of other bits and pieces but uh, for, like a lot of people, it's been Games Workshop stuff. It was never really Dungeons and Dragons. It was more small strategic specialist games, or it was, you know, the big games that Games Workshop have done, their primary um, bits and pieces. And it's really not until, I would say, maybe the last sort of 14, 15 years that I've started picking up other games um, across the various and now ever-growing uh, number of miniatures mm. providers. Indeed. Do you have a, a like a favourite mini that you've ever painted? Uh, maybe of all, oh, it's hard to always ask someone yeah. about all time, um, but maybe in the past year, perhaps. Um. Hmm. So I do have one favourite conversion, which I then painted, oh, which cool. I really enjoyed. Um, don't even know where it is right now. I think it's in a it's in a little case in the kitchen somewhere. Um, so it's actually a Games Workshop Dreadnought. Mm -hmm. Um that's been converted with a Tau Piranha to have a jetpack. So it's a giant Games Workshop Dreadnought with all the joints spaced out with loads of little um, metal uh, discs, etc. So it looks even bigger and, and sort oh, of more, yeah. more, imposing. more jointed. And then it just has basically half a Tau Piranha chopped down. It was designed as a Necromunda vehicle, chopped down. It's painted luminous D-glow orange with black <laughs> hazard stripes. And the base is kind of a rocky, um, sort of black, lavish almost effect of kind of like you would expect of a Necromunda Underhive. Mm -hmm. And 
the one of the reasons why it's my favorite is because it was the first time when my other half was experimenting with resin for other her craft projects and she made a mistake with some and it set into this completely useless bit that she then dropped on the floor and it shattered into these big transparent red chunks so I looked at the model that was stood on a lava base and I looked at those big red chunks of resin <laughs> and I went that's the stuff and just got got it all attached on and to me at least it, it's just it's not a complex paint job it's not even that detailed but it, it's just to me it's just I am a day glow orange jump pack dreadnought from the under hive and it's it's kind of a summary of my personality completely mental mm -hmm. um, yeah so I, 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 I just <laughs> I just really <laughs> like that one miniature um, there's been lots of other favorites over the years and um, different things but I actually had to go through a phase where I sold off almost, I think I would say, 99% of everything I've ever owned miniature-wise oh, yeah. at one point. But everybody goes through financial hardship and everything else. Yeah. So got rid of that. And now um, I'm re-engaging in my plastic addiction. Yes, as we that's what you should. <laughs> <laughs> because you've been doing um, Crisis Protocol and you've, you've been doing Star Wars Legion as well. Well, it's even more expensive than that. I've got some Age of Sigmar. Uh -huh. going on that I've been working on for ages slowly but surely. Uh, Star Wars Legion, I'm planning on getting some Blood Bowl bits and pieces. Yes. Uh, which I'm quite excited about because I'll play my, my little boy on that, um, which will be quite entertaining when he crushes me because his luck with dice is absolutely insane. i um, been painting up D&D &D miniatures now. Uh, first time I've ever actually really acquired D&D &D miniatures. Usually it's heroes and stuff from, from other systems. Mm -hmm. Um and loads of other miscellaneous, and I've actually got an entire army for War Machine Cricks okay. as well, which I collected, started painting, and then just kind of stopped. I don't know why. I think Deception. I was just tired. I think I was just fatigued about it. Mm. So then stopped, so I'm going to get back to that as well. So, yeah, plenty of addictive substances um, <laughs> by way of plastic <laughs> and paint light around the house just there. Excellent, excellent. Well, actually, going back to your, to your Dreadnought, so, obviously, you, you you said that you like Necromunda, and that seemed to have been the, the gateway drug for you into, into oh, yeah, all this. Yeah. Um, so, what inspired you to actually put a jetpack on a, on a Dreadnought? Because, I mean, to be honest with you, we all need jetpacks on Dreadnoughts. Well, yeah. Um, um, so, what what happened was I've played loads of different small skirmish games over the years, and Necromunda is probably one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. because you can run proper campaigns, there's progression. What it had always lacked to me is vehicle design rules. Um, so in the post 40k um, Games Workshop's Warhammer 40k VDR phase where they were allowed in tournaments and everybody went insane and the world imploded, um, I went, well that's a great concept so what I did is I took the points cost in Necromunda and rebalanced them and worked out how to build vehicle costing bit and then ran a campaign in store where you could actually have your gang and you could spend your gang's credits on buying vehicles and there were specific vehicle only scenarios so if you only had and this included having things like bicycles mm -hmm. like actual just no, I've got up my juves on a bicycle and he has to pedal really fast all the way up to I am a power fist wielding jetpack dreadnought with flamethrowers strapped to his face um, and I was like what is really cool and I was trying to I was using lots of tow bits and and pieces because I built a tow army recently and I was like, oh, I've got spear bits. Um, I didn't have a spear piranha. I actually bought a piranha just to chop into pieces <laughs> to give a dreadnought a jump pack um, because I just thought the tow piranha looked really, really nice. It was quite small, quite mm -hmm. sleek. And I was like, what would happen if a Necromunda scavy, you know, ganger engineer saw that, saw the flyer and saw a dreadnought and saw a flyer and saw a dreadnought? And I was like, Yep, he'd weld those together. <laughs> and it, it was just craziness. It's, it's as if James actually lived in the Necromander hive world. Maybe I do. <laughs> no, I don't. Because it would be terrible. I have asthma. I would choke to death in minutes. Um, but it's an, it's an interesting concept, at least. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and you talk about um, looking at rules. You do have a bit of a thing about rules, as in breaking them down and deconstructing them, don't you? Because a couple of, I think about a month or so ago, I did a review of one of your supplements. Yes. Um, um, so, so yeah. yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm, not, I'm just gonna let you talk about this now because I think <laughs> I've done ten minutes of it in the, in the past. But tell us about <laughs> tell us about de deconstructing races in D and D. Well, um, I think that the lead up 
to, to one of the, the, the biggest points about it is that no system is perfect. You know, there's loads of really, really good role-playing systems out there. Obviously, D&D, especially for the edition, is massively popular, held by loads of um, really popular shows. Um, but there's also flaws in every system. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the biggest problems is that people look at storytelling role-playing games, and then they look at D&D and wonder why it doesn't quite work. And it's simply because it's a war game that was upscaled into being a role-playing game as a sort of secondary element. And it was really a 90s thing that it started having role-playing elements. Before that, it was, I have an orc, and it's going to march 10 feet and stab you. Very much like a, a war game. And that was really the, most of the substance of it. Um, and I think the, the fiction books, while well, fantastic, didn't really play into the actual game itself really well. So for me, I, I've always been very cognizant of there's gaps in systems versus what you want to actually do. So I want to do this, the system doesn't do it, so you have to hack the rules, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. Um, and and D and D, there's always been racist mechanics, um, but I quite like and I've grown to like in role playing, especially universal systems where your own particular take or what you want to tinker with and make a bit more special or a bit more you or a bit more interesting or representative of what you believe in um, it is present and in d d that doesn't exist and one of the other problems that I think we're all aware that d d and other similar fantasy things has is they've inherited quite a, a codified way of, of considering what races are mm -hmm. sadly a lot of the time and and d d is very prevalent with that because it harks back to Tolkien and and all those base understandings of, uh, we'll call elves, all six foot six, super powered, amazing, immortal white people. Um, and in game balance terms, while that's amazing, I'm going to be an elf, they're fantastic, they're super intelligent, they're practically immortal. And I'm playing in a campaign with five other people playing humans. Mm -hmm. Oh, GM, how, how, how long is the campaign running? Well, in game time, 500 years. So all the other player characters will be dead, and I can take all their stuff. Cool. <laughs> um, you know, genuinely, like I've played in long-term twin, you know, game universes that have been running for 40, 50 years consistently. So there's a, that problem actually exists in those worlds, um, and in those player groups. So when I look at races, and I'm sitting there going, "Well, there's not really an offset for, hey, I want to be immortal, other than being, I don't age." And that's about it as a descriptor. I just look youthful all the time, or I look real old, but I act youthful. Um, there, there's not really anything to get your teeth into or balance the game out and make a player's choices significant. And obviously there's the inherent cultural bias, colonialism, all that jazz as well mm, going yeah, on. Yeah. And it's kind of unfair on the wider player base not to give them the opportunity to choose something better while still seeing, staying within those kind of lines of what they want to do but also allow people to choose to expose themselves as massive racists by saying, I want to be this stereotype. And it's like, it's much easier to find bad apples if you give them the chance to go, I like this trope. So um, replacing racism in 5th edition for me was something I was already working on. Um, and then, you know, this sort of site, the last year sort of build up of, of tension around that whole subject matter really kicked off. And I already had kind of stuff in the works. So I thought, right, let's get this finished. And really what it's designed to do, which people can go look at the videos, I'm sure the very generous Andy, who's already reviewed it, will post up some links. <laughs> yes, yes, um, I'll post some links. <laughs> um, well, well, it breaks it down into giving players agency and choice over that again, not effectively having things decided for you. I want to be a barbarian. I need high constitution. Well, I'm playing a dwarf then, aren't I? because I, why am I going to choose to drop an armor class point otherwise and, and getting away from min-maxing and allowing people to say ha, 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 I don't care about armor class I'm immortal, I invested all my choice in I just don't age screw the rest of you, I'm going to go stand in Tahiti for a thousand years ha, 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 ha um, and cackle maniacally but it's about giving that choice back and taking away that so if someone chooses to build something that's really horrible and mean and, uh, and not fair on other people, well, it's done in a system where that's all balanced out for them. So they've made that choice to be, I'm the strongest, most damaging thing, and the other players have chosen not to. And that's the whole point. It gives them that choice back. The, the thing about the races, I mean, we've had this discussion um, 
via text. You know, when I first got hold of it, I was like, "Hang on, this is this is brilliant." And the way that I role play is, I think of a character as the person. So, yep. for example, I had um, and my D and D gaming group will go along. Will will know all about this. I wanted to have a gnome who um, had lost his wife and daughter in a fire in his home. He was a healer, but he couldn't heal his wife. Hmm. So he started taking up necromancy. <laughs> tragic background, TM. Tragic, ba- massively tragic background. And we started him off in um, Curse of Strahd, which unfortunately we didn't complete. But I think they had the... Um, the oh, I can't remember what the... It, it, well, it, it, anyway, I ended up going Grave Domain Cleric, but originally okay. I liked the idea of this extremely vulnerable person who wasn't this, wasn't that, and originally I played him as a wizard, and it worked brilliantly. Keep the hell out of the way of everything, but it, it worked, and the roleplay aspect worked, and I fit the character around the roleplay. And then we decided to do him again, and my brother-in-law is... I call him Chrysopedia because he seems to know everything in the D&D book. Um, and I said to him, can you just make Turk again for me? Um, and he came back as a as a, um, a grave domain cleric. Mm. Which, if you want a tank, is absolutely fantastic. Um, Almost like someone designed a character, they wanted you to perform a function. Um, I wouldn't say it's that way. I think it's just basically he is trying to fit it in Getting the best possible character out of what optimization. Yeah, yes. Um, and Turk suddenly became an excellent tank, but the way I role played him was not a tank at all. Yeah. Um, and what I loved about that supplement is that still have you still got the offer on as well? Um, there is some of the discounts left um, that is linked on my pinned post on my Twitter yes. that you'll be able to lift it from, um, which are uh, uh, my Fire Mike Merle's discounts. Yes, yes. Because, yes, he's an ass. He's so an ass. So we should get rid of him. So if, you, if, you, if, if your viewers want to support the idea that people, I don't know, should be held to account for being assholes, uh, pardon the language there, but um, words are, um, those discounts are for you. Um, if you don't believe in that, you know people should be held accountable for the actions that Mike Merrill should probably leave D and D. Um, then feel free to pay full price. Yes, and what I'll do, I'll put a link to that in the description below. So not only just for your Twitter, but also for the uh, DM skill drive through RPG. Ah, yeah, that's fine. Yes, um, and actually, link. there's a very good reason. I'll tell your viewers why it's not on DM skill because we're they're going, <gasps> but it's D and D content, mm-hmm. but it's on drive through RPG. Yes, because DMs Guild take an extra 20% off the top. Um, so if I'm selling, which the module's base retail price is $5 mm-hmm. American, and I'm in Scotland, so we don't use dollars, which are worth less than pounds. <laughs> um, sorry. 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 Um, but if they take an extra 20%, then I'm only getting $1.50 per sale. The content and effort, so the effort alone that's gone in there, mm. no, it would imply I'm being paid in negative pence per hour, um, or negative cents per hour, depending on your economy. Uh, but th- also the art and everything else that's gone into that has cost money. So if I take an extra twenty percent cut, what I'm really saying is, this is worth two dollars fifty um, for for me to get at the end of it. So and it isn't. Um, also, I'm not fond of the idea of that I'm working entirely with content that doesn't need DMs Guild, so it doesn't fall within those licensing rules. Yeah, the the market, the extra marketplace reach would be great, but um, I'd also rather not compromise on pricing or mm. have to put something up to ten dollars when I'd rather it was available to people who don't have large budgets Absolutely. to fix a problem that Wizards of the Coast kind of created. <laughs> No, absolutely. I mean, just to, again, to my viewers, if you do get this, this, this supplement, it is absolutely jam-packed. And like I was saying, I, was, I wanted to, I will at some point, probably with your help, James, because I'm not the greatest person designing characters, but I would love to redesign Turk using the deconstruction system. Yeah. Um, nope. just, to, just to see what I get, because 
he might not be an he might not be a gnome, will he? <laughs> I hope he will well, be. But... Well, that's that's literally the fundamental thing about the system is that what you're actually choosing is biology, culture, and personal choices. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter from among those what you choose. You can say I'm a gnome, and I'm three feet tall because it doesn't at no point in the races replacing races supplement that I wrote does it mention size no. because who cares it doesn't mention um, physical ability or not because again who cares so if you want to be a three foot tall so yes. we just lost what was obviously the best rant I've ever had it's... about how everything was amazing and you should totally buy my stuff yes I mean I'm just really sorry that we lost all the footage about yeah yeah all the free footage that you gave as well, the stuff that you said this is willing yeah. to, you know, yeah. that people could just... The winning like, lottery numbers, you, you know, they, that's a shame, that was lost I know, too. I know, uh, I know. So, I, I right. mean, I, I was really looking, looking forward to winning the millions, but, oh well, oh, such a crap. Um, such is life. So, um, I will move on. Um, yes. So, <laughs> yes. replacing races um, is actually the first part of what is a much bigger project that I'm doing. So originally, I wanted to make a Scottish module for, mm -hmm. or supplement for D and D, um, because quite frankly, I was getting really annoyed at the way um, Celtic or Scottish culture is often portrayed by Wizards of the Coast um, and a lot of their writers. That, um, to put it bluntly, all dwarves are Scottish. Um, really grinds my gears. And there's a whole depth of culture there that people who come here or a lot of people who are fans of Scotland or like to trace their ancestry back to Scotland, mm -hmm. they appreciate. Um, so I thought I'd do something a bit more orientated towards that. Um, and that racist piece was actually plucked out of that larger piece of work for deployment now, basically. Um, and some of the money um, that that will help raise, um, as well as the second release that I did, which was um, a list of mythical weapons, for D and D, all, all of its own artwork and rules, etc. Um, Which I still that, have to review. Yes, you do. I know. Uh, I know. Um, so with that as well, that that again was plucked out because what I'm hoping to do with any funds that these raise past their initial creation costs, mm -hmm. they're entirely dedicated to funding what I want to build, which is a 200 plus page module all about Scotland with um, one of where I get to work with, to be honest, one of my favourite artists on Twitter right now, which is Eric Williams. Um, people should go and check his work. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Like, sure. I mean... Give me epic. a link and we'll... Um, right check Twitter, because he's only on Twitter, really, right now, and Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, you'll easily be able to find him. I'm forcing Andy to go and look, because then he'll follow him, too. I'm not ah. on Twitter, remember. Oh. I, I don't do the Twitters. I yeah. think... He's a techno. I'm a software developer in real life. That's of course, true. I don't trust anything. <laughs> trust nothing. Um, so yeah, um, I'll try and find some links because he, yeah. he's really only on Twitter. He's building a social media presence just now. Um, but I want to make sure um, that, funnily enough, that I have a diverse group of people I work with. I've got uh, an editor lined up um, who's on Twitter uh, just now who I want to be able to pay funnily enough, actual money um, up front, not just actually have to wait for the book to be kickstarted or raise money or crowdfunding via investment. Uh, you know, I, I want to be able to pay people up front for the work they do to make a product that can then go out, or at least enough of it, you know, enough of it that it's viable. There, I don't want people giving me labor to then release something that we hope pays them back. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of things that go out there that do that, and I've got to be honest, it's really unfair um, on yeah. people, and, and it's effectively slavery. Uh, yeah. I've got, I got to be perfectly honest. And there's a lot of people who get taken advantage of uh, the kindness of their hearts, or, oh, I'm a massive fan of this, and they get shifted into working yeah, for free. Modern slavery, uh, especially in the EU, is very... Yeah, yeah. yeah and, I, and I get it. We, we've only got so much money, like, I don't have tons of cash lying around to pay for art. You know, I, I scrape away at everything, mm -hmm. you know, piece by piece. I'm um, like, we all kind of have to in the real world. Um, yeah, so, so that's the plan. It's a, it's a big Scottish module, and the big villain in it is an incredibly, incredibly terrifying, honest, totally honest, 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 honest vampire 
that's based on one of my longest running role playing characters um, from a homebrewed Warhammer fantasy role playing game system used in Sterling University, my mm -hmm. alma mater, uh, twice. Um, from the role playing society, where um, a gentleman there who's been there for probably since the dawn of time um, has ran a continuous universe of characters and storyline for over 30 years. A perpetual living world. Oh, yeah. Proper, perpetual, living Warhammer role playing world. And I had a character, and he's still alive, technically, because he's a vampire, um, who, who was in it who's been in it for god since i started university basically so and that would be 2000 2002 so at least you know a good 15 years solid of play mm -hmm. that character saw and for 10 of those it was nearly three or four days a week that individual character was being played so i know that character really well um so he's now the big bad do you, do jason you have... Arnotti's. Do you have to go back to university to like pick him up or something if you've left him? Yeah, there? pretty much. You know, in a pram, he's he's old now. Yeah. Um, but no, no. So, uh, <laughs> um, so Jason Argonautis. Yes, mm -hmm. it's a pun name. I was only sixteen when I started uni, people, <laughs> um, and started properly hardcore role playing um, and and stuff. Um, but yeah, I've played a lot of different stuff, and I'm trying to bring in horror elements, but Scottish folklore, culture, but also be a bit more fair. Um, about representing everybody because you know it's not just about I want Scotland to look great it can do that on its own the country's pretty awesome um, but what I want to do is let everyone see themselves in it mm -hmm. so um, there's characters in there who are well basically not everyone in the setting is white you know um, and not everyone is human in fact generally it's a hodgepodge and there's plenty of black people, people of colour, um, of various ethnicities being represented there. And in fact, the main bad guy, the character I created oh so long ago, is Turkish in origins. You know, or the Warhammer fantasy equivalent mm -hmm. of, of Turkey, or at least that ethnicity. Um, so it is trying to be representative and give people the chance to see themselves in content where I do, we do often sadly see that's often an afterthought. Yeah. Um, to be perfectly honest. So, um, the hope is to get that 200 page model out, uh, module out um, and we'll see how it goes to be perfectly honest. Um, there are, if people want to troll back through my Twitter, I usually put in a hashtag that is hashtag to destroy a storm which allows people to go back and find all the crazy previews that I've put in including very old format stuff. Um, so there's tons of stuff in there and people will notice there's also enormous fan service from me um, towards uh, my heroes in RPG industry uh, and in, in gaming and computer gaming. And so there's tributes in there um, by me uh, putting, dropping someone who may or may not resemble Erika Ishii. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> in there, um, there may or may, may not be uh, a deity that vaguely resembles um, Swordsfall um, or and Brandon oh, know him, yeah. um, over there. Um, so th there's a lot of bits and pieces of fan service of people I admire and respect quite a lot mm -hmm. and baked into the game. So a lot of it is pulled from people I've interacted with, experiences, lessons, and um, that's all in there. And I'm hopefully going to share with people and hopefully they'll pay me real money, um, which I will, <laughs> you know, when, when when it kickstarts for ten million pounds, I I would I gotta be honest. If I got ten million pounds from that, I would probably just bring all the people I worked with over to Scotland to keep them safe. Where you know there's an actual health service. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that side of things. Okay. Uh, so yeah, but yeah, um, role playing game wise, play a lot, run a lot, um, or have done at least. Uh, I I run a lot less these days. Um, play a lot less because you know adulting, uh, etc. But. <laughs> but we have Saturday, don't we? Yes. Yes. Um, so we've just started our Saturday campaign, which I'm DMing, using the Mutants and Master Design system in Marvel Universe 666, otherwise known as James Makes Stuff Up to Make It Sound Cool. <laughs> which um, is, because it I'm is, in yeah. it, I star in it. Um, oh, well, that makes it the best universe. It makes obviously. it the best universe ever, because I get to be Way Gaia. better. Yeah, that is true. Um, so um, in that, um, obviously, uh, for people at home, um, there's a, we, I basically set it as a crossover between the Marvel Universe and Lucifer. Yes, mm -hmm. I know that's a DC property, people. You just can't make it up. 
Well, it's fancy, yeah, yeah. isn't it? So, so I've taken con- uh, not Constantine, that's what, how it connects to Lucifer. So I've taken Lucifer, the Marvel Universe, um, Predator, um, and Alien, and something else. <laughs> Jurassic Park. There we Thank go. God yeah, for that. You're looking at me like, what is he doing? And I thought, how has got the Jurassic Park thing on? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I won't say you're tone deaf, Andy. But I won't say that. So no, yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, it is a crossover of all those universes. And in our first adventure, the party have rugby tackled. Um, in one case, quite literally, um, rugby tackled um, a dinosaur um, that may or may not be a pink and purple and blue Indominus Rex clone that shoots lightning, like Godzilla. Um, and doing really well, and one character totally didn't die, and basically immediately respawned. Yes. Did they, Did they? Andy? No, no, that would yeah. never happen. You would never be crazy enough to stand in the open when facing a giant dinosaur. That was, um, that was Carlos, wasn't it? No, it was you. Who was it? Yeah, you got shot and killed. And you got back up again. Oh, yeah. I'm just thinking about... No, I'm that sure obviously that's landed heavily. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I was taking an absolute bit beasting because um, I, yes. I, well, like, like you say, for some reason, I had the worst luck with dice, and Not because you, that no, no, because you decided to use the same dice that, that I used, quite clearly that yes. carried over. Yeah, that so, is true. Um, I, I've literally never seen a dinosaur with plus. Oh, in fact. To give the audience an idea here, we're talking about an, a, a foe which has something in the region of plus 10 to 15 dice modifier consistently rolling one, two, or three on the dice. Online, on a dice randomizer built by Google, so it's yes. way beyond me running equals rand between one and three, um, or one and ten or on an Excel spreadsheet here, or using a physical dice. Um, and yet, it still sucked. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that poor, poor dinosaur... Um, is a little bit captured and tranquilized now. Yes. But yeah, it, it's fun. Um, one day there may even be artwork if people want to you know, get real artwork done to their characters, because right now I've totally stolen it from Pinterest, like the rest yes. of you. Yeah, we won't, um, be, we won't be showing that. But, um, no. but I, get, I, I love the, the inspiration that I had for Daya. I mean, it's a pre-generated um, character. Um, and just to... Sorry, I've taken it <laughs> but, Oh, um, go for it. But... I remember you put it out there on the Discord and you said, would anybody be interested in this crazy, crazy idea that I have? And it kind of like just didn't, nothing happened. So I kind of like, oh, maybe someone might be interested. And then you decided to kind of like, come here, Andy. Come here, we've got, we've got role playing for you. And here's a load of characters. And I was like, oh, just have a look. And I just got it out, had a look, and I just stood by it. And that was it. I was like, you, I don't even have time. I should be sleeping, and I'm doing this because yeah, yeah. That's it. To be honest with you, I knew you were doing that when you sent me. The, I think you sent a <laughs> gift like that, didn't you? I'm not going to. I can look for it, but I know for a fact you you pretty much uh, enticed me. Probably. Probably. Yes. What would you like to call a bad influence? You're a terrible influence. I am. I am. Don't have. It, it's... Don't have fun with this guy. He's far too much fun. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, exactly. I, I, I would will also say this is also me effectively alpha testing playing things online because mm-hmm. I've never been a big online player. I gotta be honest. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of it, mostly because up until year my internet speeds have been sub one megabyte. So now mm-hmm. I can actually speak to a real human being without it sounding like a ping pong match between delayed robots. So <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's working. Um, so it's a bit of a trial uh, and error. I'm a player in a, a Werewolf the Apocalypse um, RPG right now myself, um, but it's not playing right now because, sadly, most of the people involved in it are key workers, so yeah. they're carers or working in the NHS, um, so they're a bit busy, funnily enough, dealing with COVID-19. Um, but yeah, so plenty of stuff. Um, I'm also working on two, no, sorry, three other role-playing systems at this moment in time. Um, Cataclysm, an apocalyptic um, playing card-based one, um, which might turn into a universal system, depends on my mood. Mm-hmm. Um, 
that's more narrative based but also resource management because you're not rolling dice you know the cards you have in your hand there's going to be um a utopian one that i've yet to flesh out beyond its story and there's also going to be a role playing system that is still dice based but allows you to automatically succeed at some things for a dark sci-fi universe um, that I might end up writing as well. So this is why we need to move to Mars, because they gave you an extra 40 minutes in the day to get all this stuff done. Yeah, well, yeah, um, and if people are sitting there going, dear God, how does he cope? I don't. Um, I, Coffee, uh, what I'm it? doing it, yeah, <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I just kind of bounce between different things. Like this morning I decided, of course, because I don't have enough on my hands, that I, I really need to be designing plants. Um, because, you know, I'm not busy enough. Um, so, yeah, I have lots of interests, building models, painting models, and all that jazz. Family, I, you know, want to watch TV at the end of the day, pass out, and a day job that has me up very early in the morning. They should, they should create a, a machine, which is kind of like an, an, a reverse fax machine for your brain, because yeah. it's just, you have these ideas, and you think, obviously you're doing a great job of putting them down. Me, I have this idea, and I wax lyrical about it for about a week and then it's forgotten about and the next shiny thing comes along. Um, like starting a YouTube channel. <laughs> um, but yeah, we need these machines that just basically, you can just hard, co hard copy of idea for the week. But that's, yeah. So um, uh, what I would say is there's an, a really important skill that I think everybody forgets that is an acquired skill, right? Which is organization but not of organizing yourself but organizing your thought processes and how you deal with stuff so what i generally do is i start with an idea i jot it down somewhere but i don't just jot it down anywhere it goes onto a board and i set a reminder mm -hmm. and then i make a judgment call of this is either important when that reminder happens and i pay attention to it or it's not and it gets archived i can go back to it if i ever want or i'll sometimes comb through my archive of different ideas but much like writers do in Hollywood for film scripts or writers do for, for writing fiction um, or anybody who's developing anything, really, you keep a library of things you've thought of in the past. Um, you know, I've got novels that aren't finished you know, uh, and stuff like that. But I think the key thing is to take that moment of inspiration mm -hmm. and document it and then revisit it and in a constructed, stepped manner, move it through the chain. So go from, I wrote something down on an equivalent of a post-it to... I wrote a paragraph to, I wrote a page, now I'm going to make a plan. And that's the other piece is eventually your ideas have to turn into real plans. And, mm -hmm. you know, you and I both work in IT type professions, so um, we're used to project plans and deliverables and milestones and all that. And a lot of people aren't. And genuinely, it's one thing I would suggest everybody should do and acquires a skill is project management because it teaches you so much about yourself, um, but it also helps you reach those goals by deciding what those goals are and checking whether they're realistic or not. Anybody can do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. like, that, that, I'm not selling anything to encourage, hey, come and join my weird pyramid scheme. I'll teach you how to pay me money. Um, <laughs> if, if somebody wants to pay me money, though, that's okay. Yeah, um, yeah links in description below. <laughs> links in, they will find a way of giving me money. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, anybody can do what I'm doing. The difference is actually doing it. You know, yeah. It's one of the biggest lessons that I think um, Brandon from Sourceful has shown the world as well is that if in doubt, get up and do it your damn self because <laughs> no one else is going to do it for you. Okay. Um, and that's hopefully going to give us a nice new renaissance on lots of different things. Um, but yeah, uh, ran over, I guess. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tend to wax lyrical. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, so lots of different stuff going on, lots of different bits and pieces. Um, review that that items video. Yes, yes, Arr, yes. It's good. Well, like, like I say, I do actually, when I do my Monday musing video, um, I normally, before I start doing it, I sit down, I get the notepad out on my not very good laptop. I shall not name brand. I forgave brand. him. He not a name brand at, at all, honest. <laughs> <laughs> and I get notepad plus plus out. And I put notes and I say, this is what I want, this is what I've just achieved in the last week. And this is what I want to achieve for this week. And unfortunately, the artifacts and magical items have been on that list. <laughs> yes, I, I have very valid excuses, work excuses, life that excuses. That is very true. Yeah. And I will accept none yeah. of them. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so pl plenty of stuff going on there. 
Um, and also, um, I think you, you mentioned you want me to mention this at some point, is I also do voices. Yes. Um, I've done a bit of vo voice acting for little bits and pieces of people's pet projects. Um, and currently, the only real voice acting, I guess, um, is doing a voice, a voice of Gleason, my own little goblin-y slash weird hobbit character, um, funnily enough that may or may not be legally distinct from Smeagol, um, for Goblins of Mordor and yes. for his in intros to his videos and various other bits and yeah, pieces so and a few Stormtrooper voices as well. If anyone's actually um, watched, well, obviously everyone should be watching Goblins of Mordor's YouTube channel because uh, that's where a lot of my traffic comes from. If you wanted to know who does the voices, who is Gleeson, who is this person at the beginning, this is the face. This is what Gleeson looks like. That, that's obviously what Gleeson looks like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah totally. Um, but no, so I do voices, I can do a bit of accents and, and stuff like that, but yeah. So, uh, if anybody happens to want to pay me money to do Gleeson's voice, and I do lots of voices things, and stable stable death, because Gleeson likes to do the stable stable ultra death. Maybe um, I should uh, turn into Turk and like talk to you, because I think that would be wonderful if Turk and Gleeson could talk together. I'm a dad, I might have to buy an act. Oh no, you wouldn't need Max with me. Chains are killing the fire! Kill it! No! No, not fire! That's how I lost my, my wife and my daughter! No! But how else do I make your taste to eat? Well, you don't, do you? Well, <laughs> some hackle. Cool. Down! Down now! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, can do a bit, can do a bit of voice acting. Just remember that everything um, that you kill, Turk will happily resurrect. <laughs> He may regret that when I'm halfway through eating it. Um, <laughs> food maybe takes on a whole new meaning. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, yeah, so there's some bits and pieces there. I was really, really tempted to completely fool your audience by stubbornly spending the entire time in an Australian accent and uh, ju just really sticking to it and pretending that I, I live in some kind of 30 degree country. I, I am actually Australian and I've been pretending to be English for the past, well, since I joined Goblins of Mordor. That, that would make sense, um, yeah. except for the fact that you're so damn pale. <laughs> That's the Irish face skin. <laughs> but yeah, so um, there's opportunity there if people want. Worst case scenario, find me on Twitter, unless you're Andy. Um, find me on Twitter, <coughs> drop me DMs, send me lots of shiny things, pay me on Ko-Fi, whatever, crazy funding stuff. Um, but whatever people do, if they're on Twitter... You should absolutely make sure to check out Eric Williams. I'm working with him on a couple of pet projects of his own, um, helping him with different bits and pieces. And his art not only is fantastic, but the level of progress he shows is amazing. Um, you should probably just go visit lots of amazing people you know, on Twitter and, and make sure that they're not horrible, terrible humans. Because there's a big spate of ter horrible, terrible humans being revealed right now. So please curate your feeds, curate who you follow, um, and call people out if they're assholes. Excellent. Rant over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we've pretty much. You've, you, I always say that you've got the fingers in all the pies, don't you? So we've, we've covered I do the matches. We've covered the voice acting. Um, I remember you do music as well, don't you? Yes, I do. I've done some tunes. I did some music work for Michael, which he didn't end up using, so Michael Mordor. Um, but I've also got tunes that have also been sent out um, for people to freely listen to. Um, sort of fan or using their games, fantasy music, um, and the plan is with when I do Kickstarter to destroy a storm, um, as the larger module, there'll be um, a whole bunch of music that I make to go with that. So again, hashtag to destroy a storm. You can probably go find those bits and pieces. Um, I also make props I for games and also role playing. Um, so I don't know if it will show up very well on, on screen, but. Uh, a little prop bone charm for my Werewolf the Apocalypse game. Yeah, that's quite disgusting. <laughs> uh, um, or a, li a little fake brass medallion Okay, for, so for the game as well. I'm finding out way more about you, and I, I thought I knew you. I also do foam craft cosplay uh, <laughs> stuff, uh, or at least I mostly do it for my son. Mm -hmm. um, and my wife is actually super skilled at crafting, so oh, yes. we actually sent him to one Halloween disco as one of the dancing robot guys from L LMFAO's music videos. 
um, you know, party rocking and all that jazz. So, uh, yeah, we got a lot of stuff on. I write, I paint, I draw. I do way too much stuff. I should you, probably have cloned myself by now. Uh, that apparently happens. I, I lie down, and the next thing I know, my alarm goes off in the morning. <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> it's generally the way it goes. I, I'm looking around the room. If anybody's wondering why I'm staring around the place, it's literally me looking around the room to figure out if there's anything I forgot to mention. <laughs> um, like, huh? Oh, uh, I yeah, no. Game design, wargaming design, blah, 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 yeah, yeah, all that kind of jazz. Um, the only thing I would say um, to people as well is I, I, I've experienced most of the systems and most of the challenges you're all going through. There are a few systems out there which, even if you're a hardcore D&D player, you should really go and check out, and this is advice to you as well, Andy, for, for all playing games and anyone, because they're really well executed, they're really fair, they're really open, and they're really adaptable. Um, the first is Mutants and Masterminds Second Edition, which is the one we're using right yep, now. Yeah. There is Big Eyes Small Mouth Second Edition, which you can get hold of by PDF. Um, yes, the publishing company originally responsible for it were a little bit dodgy in some respects, but the content's really, really valuable and is much more anime and therefore operatic in its content. So, but it's again, it's another universal system. The only other sort of systems I would highly recommend people explore is the ones that were originally by White Wolf, so things like Aberrant or Werewolf or Vampire the Masquerade, mostly because they're focused on gritty narrative mechanics, mm. um, to be honest, and they introduce different mathematical concepts. Um, but also, I would highly recommend, I think it's now split off into Onyx Path Publishing, um, but one of my favourite systems of all time to play in um, as characters, um, it, it, well, it's two separate sort of game settings, but much the same system, which is Sion, um, and Exalted, which are incredibly high power, incredibly high fantasy, over-the-top cinematic action games. And if anybody wants to understand, really, uh, if they've never heard of Exalted, any system where I can make a starting character who can create an ability that is irresistible god palm technique, which basically says, I slap you so hard, you die. <laughs> and leave an imprint in the ground behind you, shaped like my hand, like Kung Fu Hustle. Yeah. I'm sold. You're sold. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that's a bit of advice. And don't be afraid to stop buying dice and buy products. You need one damn set of dice. I do, however, myself have hundreds of sets of dice. Yes. But I don't need them. But I've also had the, the joys of owning many, many systems. So. Did you know that I sell dice on my website? No, you don't. <laughs> Get your crack away from me, you the terrible good, the, the good thing is, I, I, if you bought any, I wouldn't be able to do anything because it's somewhere around here is all the dice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm well loaded down with dice. This is how well loaded that, down I am. Literally within arm's reach, two sets. Yeah. Ready to go. And... The big bag of dice in a different ducat, and uh, a deck box full of dice, because you know why not? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I do also play collectible card games with my son. Mm -hmm. Pokemon. Oh, yeah. um, and I used to play Magic: The Gathering. But if anything was ever worse than dice as a as a crack addiction, it's definitely Magic: The Gathering. Um, so I stopped that. Some years well, ago, I'm <laughs> never starting a game because, dear lord, that was bad. Um, it's a money so pit, right, isn't it? Smidgen, when you start spending £500 per release and just bulk buying boxes of boosters because it's actually cheaper than buying individual cards um, and then profiting by the resale, that's when you know you have a problem because yes. what you're really doing is I bought a big block of drugs and I'm cutting it yes. and keeping the good stuff for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. The, distribu yeah. the distribution methodology is exactly the same. <laughs> hey man, do you want to buy a pack of 20 uncommons? You know, not implying that anybody with that accent is a drug dealer, but it's the only accent I feel that I can make sound dodgy um, because I just sound like I work in IT or in a call centre, quite frankly. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think that's it. 
uh, my wife, um, who is super crafty, um, she breeds snakes, tarantulas, various other um, invertebrates as well. I've only seen these, the snakes and the invertebrates. Sorry, the tarantulas and the invertebrates. I haven't seen the snakes, so she got them on the YouTube channel as well. Um, she will be soon, potentially. Um, so I, in the room, man, there's three of them, and there's one extra being delivered. The breeding program starts in two years, um, mm -hmm. which she's prepping for now. Um, so I bought her a cabin. She filled it with arachnids. I am okay with this. Um, You're not near a nuclear, bun nuclear bunker or anything? No, just where all the petrol comes from. Yes, I'm in yes, the whole of, course, of the UK. Yeah. Really. So, yes. you know, uh, terrifyingly dangerous. I won't say specifically where, because that way people won't come and hunt me down and kill me. Because, <laughs> you know, the internet. We're all lovely here. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there's anything else that's really that interesting. No, I think um, we, we've pretty much got it all covered. But, um, yeah, I will actually say thank you ever so much for appearing on Geek Curio. And definitely we're going we're gonna to be pushing that to destroy a storm to the hill. So there will be links down there. Um, we might even have to make a little advert or something to play in the, in the video, I think. That would be fun. Um, you have one. You have one. I know Gleason's got one on your YouTube channel. No. No? Oh no! Oh, sorry. You're meaning the promo videos oh, I did promo, for uh, yes. the races module. Yeah. So um, those videos actually help explain um, what. It, so it, before anybody goes and spends any money, you can actually see two workthroughs or one demo of what the content looks like and one actual walkthrough of creating a race um, on YouTube. And and they hopefully can link the YouTube videos in the doobly doo, um, and um, oh, the, the description. Yeah, the power of doobly doo. Um, and yeah, so it's to pro basically it's save anybody spending money, they can actually go and look at what the content actually looks like and see what it does and, and see how it works. Um, and then go and spend the probably terrifying amount of $2.50, um, which in, in pounds is probably around about two quid um, if they're using the, um, the appropriate get rid of pe horrible people discount. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it's $5, which is about four pounds and change. So not exactly a terrible expense. Um, and the weapons, um, there's various tiers in the weapons one, um, including absolutely silly tier weapons, um, which I don't know if you've really read through that far yet, Andy. Um, so, not that <gasps> oh, not that there's far. some fun in there for you. Um, so yeah, so the, it's a whole set of weapons from absolutely, hey, look, a vaguely magical thing, all the way to, ah, it's talking to me. Um, oh, so, I've got to those one. Yeah, I've, 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 uh, I've been reading some of the descriptions. I've been, I yes. think, with with me, um, like I say, I've got a job which is very cerebral. So when I'm not working, I turn into a five-year-old pretty much. So when I'm when I'm looking for it, the great thing about your book is it's got lots of pictures in it. So <laughs> when I see a picture that I like, when I got when I see a picture that I like, I'm like, you know. So um, yeah, I, I think I remember some of the silly ones now. It was a good yeah. three or four weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Um, I should just force you just get a whip and get working, man. Um, but yeah, cool. Um, we can call it quits there if you want. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I say, thank you ever so much for appearing on the show. And we, we I, well, I'm probably going to be speaking to you at some point on Discord tonight, tomorrow. We pretty much talk every day, don't we? So, not just to me. Constantly. Um, but yeah, um, so have a nice time, everybody. And for those who are following Geek Curio or not, and you really should be, um, you know, speak to us. We're real people. You can DM us and things and talk to us on the social medias, although not Andy. If you want you to talk to me, please leave James a DM and he will get back to me. <laughs> and feel free to gift that anybody who needs one that goes no sufficiently. Um, <laughs> Yeah, don't DM me on Twitter. I will ignore you unless I know who the hell you are or your first message is sufficiently interesting well, and sound like a scam. I like comments. And I reply to comments. Yes. Almost ah. all of them. Almost cool. all. Because there's only about three or four. Leave <laughs> comments in the doobly 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 doo. You need the, my doobly out of this. <laughs> no, no. I, go for his doobly's. Yeah. Well, um, Thank you very much, James, and I think we shall say goodbye to... Oh, I'm going to say goodbye to you, and we're going to say bye to all the people who watch Geek Curio, and thank you for staying this long. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.